right, everybody. Welcome to part three of uh, the lost foam intake manifold casting project. Uh, I'm not going to go over everything I did in the first two videos. If you, uh, you're interested in the pattern construction method, uh, that's in the very uh, part one uh, video of the same title. But I basically used the exact same methods to reconstruct um, the second pattern for the second attempt. The results of the first attempt are there in the background, and uh, that's all cataloged in part two. So uh, it was a near success, but um, I had some uh, leakers and, and uh, mold destabilization in several of the runners. So I'm having a second go at that. And this is the pattern. Um, I'm going to simplify some things on the pattern. Um, I'm going to eliminate this uh, feature in the center that was there because I have a another way of performing that function. But this is the resulting pattern. I thought what I'd do is just uh, point out some of the more interesting features um, of the part from the standpoint of it being an intake manifold. But uh, this intake is an independent runner or individual runner um, uh, manifold that uses two inline auto light carbs with a barrel for each cylinder. And it's done in the uh, style of the Trans Am racing intake manifolds of the time, and one of those features that were prominent uh, then were these water snouts. So this is how the coolant is extracted uh, from the cylinder heads and uh, delivered to the radiator, and through a hole in the flange of the cylinder head is connected to this snout, and the same thing on this side here to this snout. So those are all cored out in lost foam, and uh, those features actually did produce quite nicely uh, um, on the, uh, the first attempt of that. A couple other things, um, because of the uh, cylinder head bolt pattern and the close proximity of the carbs uh, to, the, to the cylinder heads, they cover up some of the mounting hole patterns. So in order to mount the intake manifold, several of the bolt holes need to pass through the interior um, of the uh, carburetor flange. And it's a pretty uh, unique uh, set of casting features there. That cavity, if you can see, is hollow behind there. And I sat that on a fixture, and I just bored for that boss um, while it was on that fixture and inserted that boss. And uh, I'll do the same thing um, when it's uh, to be machined, and it'll get counterboard, and that head will get sunk below the uh, intake runner surface in there to minimize any uh, disruption to flow. But that was actually required on, on three um, of the cylinders uh, uh, um, and the bores, the carburetor bores on either side. You can see here on the other side, there's, there's three more here, here, and here. So uh, outside of that, it's on the, the same uh, cylinder spacing as the uh, uh, 335 series uh, cannon valve Ford engines, which is four and three eighths inch. The whole thing's about... Uh, 22 inches long by about 12 inches wide by about four and a half inches deep. And uh, a couple of the other features is I went ahead and put frame rails on the bottom so you could have a vacuum plenum um, down there. Uh, most of the engines that you would run this on wouldn't be pulling much vacuum and you wouldn't be thinking about the vacuum. But uh, there's uh, some secondary uh, um, uh, utilization of the vacuum plenum that can be used um, for tuning. Now one of the things is I'm going to change the orientation of this part in the mold on that. And in the previous uh, um, attempt, it was basically put like uh, this here with the, the snouts down, but the carb flange is pointed downward as well. This one is going to be pretty much vertical on that. And when you pack this mold, these features in here, these undercuts, will pack pretty nicely. Um, but these up here... Um, which isn't much of an undercut here, but if you look up in that corner, if you can see in that corner right there, very difficult to see, um, there is um, some undercuts. That would be hard to fill, but I put this uh, boss to access the plenum um, in there, and I actually bored the hole in it, which I, I wouldn't normally do because I almost always drill my holes in that, but that hole will help um, the sand flow through that back cavity and fill that cavity and stabilize it. So I put that in there. But uh, anyway, so that's the intake manifold uh, pattern. And again, you can uh, review the uh, videos, part one, part two of the same title um, in the series. 
and you can see uh, kind of the methods that I use to produce the, the pattern itself. So next uh, I'm going to gate it and uh, I'll refer to uh, part two on that because I'm going to simplify the gating as well and I'll just rejoin you here shortly um, after I apply the feed system to it and we can have a little discussion about that. Thanks. All right, everybody, I'm back with you again, and I've got the pattern uh, and the feed system, the gating and the runners uh, all constructed and attached. Uh, made some changes uh, uh, since the first uh, or the part two uh, first attempt at the pour. Um, if you go back and watch that uh, video, um, I've got this pouring basin that's got about 10 pounds uh, capacity uh, reservoir um, in it. And I filled that pouring basin and sat there and waited for the pattern to start taking uh, metal from that big cup. And boy, did it. It sucked it down in about one or two seconds. So um, I couldn't keep up with it. And I, I may have uh, um, uncovered the sprue. So I concluded that I was, must have been pretty grossly overgated on that. So what I did was I basically eliminated all this runner system that was on top of the uh, of the intake manifold. It had more branches as you can see out to here and was feeding each of the carb flanges and it was one more trunk line going down this side of the manifold. I basically just eliminated that and kept the system um, on the bottom which is just a fork. Um, you can see the fork there at the top that contacts uh, this uh, half inch thick chunk of the manifold here and then it contacts the uh, most massive sections of the manifold, which is where the flange um, meets the, uh, the lower flange for the plenum there. And these flanges are a half an inch. And uh, actually, when I made the, uh, uh, the, uh, the runners, um, I put a little thought into it. And this is what the cross section of, of the runners uh, look like here. You can see there's a 45 degree angle. They're 5 eighths wide this way. They're one and a quarter wide, or tall. And then um, I just chamfered the side of it and narrowed the, uh, the contact point here uh, down to a quarter of an inch. So there's a quarter of an inch that runs all the way down uh, the uh, pattern on each side. But the, the runner itself is five and an eighth by quarter. And then it tapers down to about uh, five uh, and an eighth by a half inch down here at the end. The thought being, you know, as you, as you feed the pattern, you need less runner um, system to feed it down here. And a quarter inch contact uh, on both sides is still a massive amount uh, more surface area um, than the sprue, which is this little bugger right here, which is tapered from uh, one and a half inches square at the top to one and a quarter inches. And it meets down here with the with the Y and the runner system and I'll just attach that um, uh, right before I uh, fill the mold with hot melt because you put that sprue on the end out there and it's just weak and you know, going to break off and instead I cemented on this little uh, wooden button here and glued that on with hot glue and I've got a screw in the end there and that's what I'll hang it from when I dip it. So it's um, you know a drastically simplified uh, gating system for it and uh, it will be positioned um, up and down uh, this way so with with the snouts here facing down pointing like this and uh, there's the gate system and it'll, it'll also have a little bit of cant to it so as to put um, a little bit more steepness uh, through the sand that runs through um, the runners so that's it but it's a very very simple by comparison uh, gating system. Try to get you a full view of it here in the uh, in the video there. But that's it. So I'll position that sucker more or less vertical with a little bit of cant to it uh, like so. Um, can't see it in the full screen of the video but uh, you can kind of get the idea of it here when you see this part up close. A little bit of cant like this to help more slope through the runners. And then uh, I'll come back here with you and um, when I pack it, I uh, made some changes too. I've got uh, brand new sand. It's fresh uh, sand. I noticed that my old sand, when I was sifting it, has probably become contaminated. But it just didn't flow and move under vibration as easily 
as fresh new sand uh, did. So we're going to have uh, new mold media. My old media was five years old, so it didn't owe me anything. So uh, 35, 40 bucks later, I've got 500 pounds of uh, fresh new sand on that. And a new position in the mold and uh, a slightly different packing method, which I'll elaborate on uh, in the next segment here. And I'll join you with that shortly. Thanks a lot. Hi everyone, back with you. Just thought I'd show you the processed pattern here that's been dip coated. I always like the looks of patterns uh, after they've been dip coated and dry because um, they have such a nice uniform refractory coating on them. I dipped this uh, yesterday afternoon, late afternoon, and uh, after drying overnight in the morning, this is what it looks like. I'd say it's probably Oh, 90% dry. I mean, certainly the external features um, are dry uh, on that. Um, even the features that are kind of tucked away, um, you know, some of the deeper crevices. Looks like the, uh, the runners are, you can't really see down um, into the runners here as well as I can. Um, but uh, they tend to be a little uh, wetter just because uh, the relative humidity, the vapor pressure from the uh, uh, wet slurry evaporating in there, it raises the vapor pressure and it just doesn't go as quickly. So uh, it's probably dry enough to pour right now everywhere, um, except I'd be a little concerned about the interior runners. So what I've done before is I just make a little drying accelerator and uh, I'll show you that in a minute, but basically I just carve up a cardboard box uh, that's a plenum and put a little muffin fan on it and it forces air through the openings and it'll dry this thing out bone dry in a couple hours. So uh, anyway, yeah, it looks, uh, looks nice. I was able to uh, dip it. First thing I did was uh, dip it uh, this end down uh, this way up to about uh, the third pair there. And then I turned it around and uh, dipped it the other direction like this. And then um, I hung it, uh, let it drip for a long time. I hung it on that uh, that uh, screw right there above the the slurry, and let it drip uh, drip off for 15 or 20 minutes. And then, uh, as you saw in the picture, turned around and sat it um, on its drying legs. Which uh, here, I, I incorporated these just for the mere fact of allowing me to take it down off the hook and uh, let it set flat and uh, let it dry the rest of the way. Otherwise, uh, the, little, the little legs here serve no purpose other than just uh, drying legs on that. So anyway, I'll, I'll give you just a, a, a quick shot of the uh, drying box, the plenum, the forced air plenum, um, and then uh, we'll get on with molding. Just thought I'd uh, show you folks uh, this little uh, dryer that I made for the internal passages. They're the, the runners. All I did was take a box and use it as a plenum and uh, cut some holes where the intake runner holes were after it was already drying up on the exterior. And then, uh, of course, cut a uh, hole down here for the fan. And uh, and you turn this little muffin fan on. You get uh, pretty good movement. So you see all eight runners are getting a little forced air through them there. That'll really dry things out uh, quite a bit um, more quickly on those internal passages. So instead of waiting a couple days, you know, or a day or two to make sure it was very dry, I just uh, spent 15 minutes and carved up that cardboard box. All right, hello everyone. Started uh, packing the mold with the intake manifold pattern. Very similar to the uh, uh, episode two version, except um, a little different orientation here um, of the uh, pattern. You can see it's almost straight up and down with a little bit of cant leaning the way that would tend to make the uh, the angle and the slope through the runner uh, steeper. The idea is to get better flow of sand uh, through there. You might notice in the background all fresh sand, um, which is uh, very nice and dry and, and pure uh, silica sand on that. So 
I'm about ready to pack it. And the uh, other difference here is I'm going to pack it uh, and vibrate it uh, four or five levels at a time. I filled the mold right up so the, uh, the first pair of runners are covered. Um, I also, you may see on the far side there, I also nearly tripled um, my vibratory force. I replaced uh, a couple of the small um, turbine vibrators with two of the larger ones like was on the bottom of the keg. I can't pull those continuously because I don't have enough compressed air to do it, but I can charge up my tank and probably power them for four or five minutes at a time, which is plenty uh, on that. So I ought to be able to shake the living dickens uh, out of this uh, lighter um, mass and then as it fills up, I guess what I'm thinking is, is that I'll already have all of the ports uh, uh, covered and the pattern itself covered by the time I get, uh, oh, 300 pounds of sand in there, two, three, 250, 300 pounds of sand in there. And having kind of gradually done it in stages, I'm on the way up. Um, hopefully I'll get a nice solid pack on that. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll turn the vibrators on, which makes a heck of a racket right now. I won't put you through that, but maybe I'll stop back in here at a couple different stages throughout the uh, um, packing of the flask. All right, I'm back with you. You can see that uh, I've filled it right up to the limit um, of my flask uh, without the uh, flask extender uh, there. I vibrated it uh, in three different stages, basically every time I covered another runner. Um, I was really getting really good action, so I don't think I can shake it much better than uh, what I've done so far. But uh, I'll put the first flask extender on uh, next and uh, also glue the sprue on and uh, fill that up maybe and revisit you here in a, in a second when I do that. And then uh, put the final extender on and uh, finish the, uh, the uh, flask uh, packing. All right, everyone, I'm back with you. Just... Uh, Next stage, um, filled it uh, so to the point where I needed to attach the sprue, got the sprue attached, and then uh, next uh, segment here, I'll fill it, put the other extender on and fill it right up to the uh, bottom of, uh, or the top of the sprue, and then install the pouring cup, uh, and then we'll take it from there. All right, everyone, back with you. Um, you see I filled right up to the top of the sprue. Time to install my... Uh, pouring cup here. Um, remember from the last video, I've got a uh, offset pouring basin with a weir in the bottom and this top part here is just uh, an extender and a big target to give me uh, you know, a big target to shoot at and a little bit more uh, capacity as far as reserve capacity in the cup. But uh, you can see the bottom there is an inch and a half square, fits the top of that uh, square sprue. And I'll just set that down there on top of the sprue, wedge it on there a little bit, and I'll fill it up the rest of the way, rejoin you then, and uh, after that, the mold packing will be complete. All right, everyone, back with you here. Uh, mold filling's complete. You see the pouring cups in place. I've uh, vibrated the living daylights out of it. Um, so uh, all that's left is to complete the staging for the pour. I've had metal in the pot since... Uh, I flipped the switch right before I started packing the mold, so I got to complete the staging uh, there and the preparation uh, for that, get everything positioned, and uh, hopefully here next shot it'll be uh, time to pour it. Back soon. All right, back with you. The moment of truth is upon us. Time to pour. Uh, again, if you want to uh, know anything more about the pattern or the equipment, just visit uh, part one and part two of this series of the same title. Um, just to recap a little bit, the changes that I made since the last pour um, are primarily new mold media, uh, mold packing method, um, a little bit more vibratory uh, energy, um, uh, slight changes of the gating uh, on the pattern and positioning of the pattern uh, in the mold. and. Uh, Outside of that, it's uh, basically just round two. So I'm going to do a final skim here and then uh, pour it and we'll see how it goes.
Well, um, it behaves quite a bit differently than the first pour. Um, first part of the pour, I don't know, it's kind of sloppy with it. I'm still having a uh, hard time getting used to pouring with that big clunker, but um, the first part of the pour seemed to go awfully well. The, uh, it filled up and uh, it sat there and then it took, uh, it took metal and I was able to keep up with it, but um, Later in the pour, there was um, some burping going on back through the cup, which has me a little nervous uh, on that, but um, it did take the right amount of metal like last time. Um, I had the exact amount left over that I expected to, so uh, most of the metal, um, enough metal, went into the mold to fill the part. It's just a matter of whether it did and whether I had a stable mold and have a good part. I guess, you know, one thing about lost foam casting and casting in general is you just don't know until you demold. So we'll give her uh, 15 or 20 minutes to solidify uh, in the mold there, and then uh, I'll dump it on the ground, demold it, and we'll see what we've got. Be back shortly. All right, back with you. Time to demold. First peek to see what we've got. I'm going to try to uh, separate this mold uh, in the middle and see if I can break the top half loose because if I don't do that this sucker is really top heavy and I don't know if I'd be able to keep it uh, at 450 pounds I don't think I'd be able to keep it from crashing over when I tilted it I don't know it depends on how it spills out of there but I think if I knock the top half of the mold out it'll be a lot more controllable so let's see how that goes I haven't done that before but here goes
Well, back with you, and I gotta tell you, first impressions look pretty good. Um, I didn't see any uh, leakers into the runners like last time. Um, it's mostly a complete part. I mean, I can't tell about the details just quite yet. I was just trying to get it in the uh, the quench tank there, but uh, I'll get it cleaned up a little bit, and after I do, we'll take a closer look at it uh, inside. Stay tuned. All right, hello everyone. I'm back with you, and uh, I've uh, cleaned up the casting a little bit. Um, I cut the sprue um, off the back side here, but other than that, uh, all I did was uh, dip it in water and use compressed air to blow off the refractory. So um, <clears throat> it's still kind of dirty. Um, one thing I wanted to mention too, or the comments uh, in one of my videos uh, about carbon condensation trails, and uh, one thing that's different uh, than probably in commercial practice is, is that uh, I, uh, I quench these things in water, and that, uh, that shock blows off a lot of the refractory. It just falls off naturally. But what it also does is um, it reactivates all the refractory because it's not fired, and it turns to this uh, uh, mud slurry, but the refractory is full of carbon um, because the carbon uh, diffuses out of, of the pattern through the refractory, but it gets caught up in the refractory. But when it dissolves in water, it's basically like washing this whole thing in a, in a carbon mud pie. So uh, a lot of that that you see is just the residual from the uh, refractory coating um, being reactivated into slurry. Um, if I go and I media blast it, it'll look uh, nice and bright. In fact, uh, some of you might have noticed um, I had attached to the sprue um, this little wing, and what that was was this uh, little uh, keychain here. So it's going to be a little memento for the uh, new owner of the intake. It was born at the same time the intake was, but uh, it's got a logo on one side and it's got the part number of the intake uh, on the other. But you can see it's. Um, it's nice and bright, and uh, it'll be a nice little, you know, trivial thing to have with it. But back to the intake, um, I got to say, I'm very happy with it, and uh, it's a 100% fully formed intake that looks uh, every bit like what the pattern did. I can't really find any flaws. There's a couple of minor things that came really close to being a problem that aren't going to be a problem at all. But, but uh, I'll, I'll point those out to you, but what I'll probably do, um, since I can't really hold the intake up and get it real close to the, uh, to the camera, I'll probably take the camera in my hand and show you um, how some of the finer details of the intake turned out. But first, just for kind of the macro view, <clears throat> you can see what's sitting there. All of the external features um, are perfect. There aren't any washouts, any leakers. Um, it's a really nice part. I'm really happy with it. On that, you can see, uh, you know, the external features and the ears are formed. And then on the underside, everything is formed perfectly on the underside too. Even the even the features clear back here in these undercuts and back in here. So uh, it's a it's going to be a very nice part um, for sure. And uh, what I'll probably do after we get done taking a look at the the raw casting here. I'll go ahead and start degating it, and after I degate uh, the top of it here, um, get that gate off, uh, I'll take it and just use uh, some uh, real fine glass beads and just uh, color it up nicely like I did with the keychain here, and then we'll come back and take uh, another closer look at it. But uh, maybe just to start with here, um, I'll, uh, I'll pause and I'll come back and I'll actually show you um, some of the close-up details uh, and how they came out. All right, you can see from the top uh, the uh, eight carburetor openings to the runners. Let's see if we can have a look inside of each one, see what we can see here. So there's one. We'll move right down from uh, four down to cylinder number. Well, it's actually the other side, so it was eight, uh, connects to eight, but this is number seven. Just running down the side of the bank there, six and goes to five on the other side of the intake. And then likewise, if I move over to the opposite side of the intake, I'm gonna come back to that little hickey you see there on top of the carburetor flange. We're looking at the internal part of the runner. You can see 
Each one looks exactly like what the pattern did. All nicely formed. Very nice. And we'll see if I can show you, but you can kind of get an idea through looking at the uh, inside of these. They're also pretty nice. Somewhere here, I had a, oops, sorry, I don't mean to make you dizzy. Let's try that again. There you go, you can see light through a couple of them there. But same thing goes for the other side. Let's see if we can have a look at the, uh, at the underside. All right, so here's a look at the underside. You can see the pockets here in each side of them, back in under each runner. And this one is a really deep one here. Let's see if I can... Yeah, you can see way back in there, that one filled in pretty nicely too. So, same thing on the other side. If I turn the intake around, you'd see the same thing on there. Let's um, look at the uh, front and back details. All right, here's the front. Look at it there. You can see underneath the runner and the snout. So that looks pretty good. Let's have a look at the back side while we're at it. And here we are at the back side. You can see underneath the runner there. And actually that hole going through, that was the one that actually aided packing that cavity is why I put that hole there. But um, yeah, I think uh, after I get it degated and a little media blast, it'll color up and be a nice looking part. Now there is one very, very minor flaw that uh, you might have caught uh, when we were looking at the runners earlier, but it all, it's on the uh, number one uh, opening, carburetor flange opening. If I zoom in on it here, it's this little bugger right here. Now it's only about 60 thousandths deep, and if you also look here, you'll see that this edge is, is pretty rounded, you know, compared to the rest of the edges. So I might have been pretty close to having a, you know, a cold shut uh, there. This looks like a little uh, fold flaw that is uh, common in, uh, in lost foam castings, but it's really small. I mean, that, uh, that tip you see there next to it's about two tenths of an inch in diameter. And um, I, uh, I allowed an eighth inch uh, machine stock allowance. So this and that rounded edge will completely go away uh, with machine stock. But uh, other than that, that is the only flaw uh, on this pattern that I can find. Um, and it is so, so minor. Um, after the machining is done, it'll become um, a point of history on all of that. So. Outside of that, I think the part looks pretty much exactly like the pattern. Um, I'll clean it up a little bit more and degate it and uh, media blast it and color it up and we'll have a look at what the uh, finished casting looks like. Stay tuned. All right, hello everyone, back with you. Um, degated the casting and uh, cleaned it up a little bit, deburred it and uh, gave it a light media blast. So. Uh, I gotta say, I think we got a winner. Um, I also took a light uh, skim pass uh, over the top of the carb pads um, and also uh, across the bottom so it's squared up. But uh, you can see I showed you most of the details in the uh, previous uh, episode or previous uh, segment there. But uh, it's colored up now and pretty uniform uh, color so it tends to make the casting look a little bit better. But uh, it's, a good, uh, it's a good casting, and I'm looking forward to uh, machining it. Give you a couple different uh, views of it here, and maybe I can put some still photos uh, in the video as well. Uh, have a look at the underside, also cleaned up, uh, very nice. So, uh, see this way. Maybe have a look at the... Uh, Funnel feature there. Yeah, looks pretty good. And then uh, the rear. So, uh, yeah, I guess second time's a charm. Um, I 
we got a good casting uh, to machine now. Um, I'll have to heat treat it. I'll probably just take it to T5. I don't uh, want to risk hurting it trying to get that last uh, little bit out of it at T6. But uh, I'll get the majority of the strength and machinability out of it um, at that. And uh, I guess it's time to start plotting my machining strategy for it. But uh, yeah, it's nice to uh, have a successful outcome. And uh, thanks for sticking with me through it. And uh, who knows if I... Uh, uh, maybe there'll be an episode four when I uh, completely finish out the induction system on that. Uh, but anyway, that wraps up the uh, casting part of it, and uh, it's nice to own on or nice to end on an upbeat. Thanks for watching, and uh, please consider joining the HomeFoundry.org. I'll put a little plug for that in um, at the end. If you want to see more um, about this build from the very beginning, there's a long thread there about it, and uh, bunch of my other lost foam castings as well as um, a lot of other skilled casters in all kinds of disciplines both uh, shell investment all kinds of sand uh, casting so good folks there if you're a casting enthusiast um, please consider joining till next time we'll see you thanks for watching